quite a few years back, actually, okay, we have everybody from grade two and up here, and you grade twos, you've been sitting for a while, so anybody that's a kid, or a kid at heart, why don't you guys stand up for a second? Just stand up. If you're little, if you feel little, very good. All right, just give me a couple of these really quick. Do this. All right, and reach way up. No one? Just me? Okay, fine. Ah, there, very good, because this is going to be long. All right, you guys can see. <laughs> I'm a terrific salesman, by the way. Did I tell you that? Uh, <laughs> you know, we all struggle with this, this idea that we want to live what we teach, right? We want to live out what we say we are. And all of us come to grips with this in one way or another. And the question that always arises is, how do I be better at what I do? How do I be better at being a Christian? How do I be better in love with Jesus? How do I be better even at showing it to other people? And I've always struggled with this idea. Back when I was in university in, in Halifax, I was working at this store and everybody at the store knew that I was a Christian. I, I didn't hide that from anyone. I was open with it as much as I could be. And uh, it usually didn't yield much results in terms of of increasing my faith or increasing the faith of the people around me. And so, you know, after a while, they just stopped asking me questions and I stopped kind of going there because we got to know each other and we were being friends, that type of thing. And I remember one shift, I, I came in and on my way inside the store, there was a man just sitting out front on the step. He had a cup with him and he just was asking every single person that came in if they happened to have any money. Now, uh, my whole generation, we don't carry money anymore. We have these little plastic cards and so... We didn't have anything to give him, or I didn't have anything to give him, and I kind of half-heartedly apologized and kind of walked into the store and went about my business. And to be honest with you, I forgot all about him after that. We were going about the night, it was a busy night, all those things were happening. And then, about halfway through my shift, a couple came in, and I could tell that they were going to need me because I was the manager. They had that look on their face. You know when somebody's on the warpath, when they're just really upset and specifically with you, you can just tell, you just know that something bad is coming. And so I took that deep breath and I just waited for the big barrage of insults to come at me because it used to happen all the time when you rented videos. People just got mad at you for no reason. And so I was standing there just ready for this and they said, there's a guy out front and he asked us for money. And my response wasn't great. I went, so? And then they got really mad. And they said, you shouldn't be allowing them to be out there. It's very, very, I don't remember what, you know, we're in a church. I can't exactly quote them word for word what they were saying. But they said, essentially, you need to take care of this problem. You need to make him go away. Now, all my staff knew what I taught and what I preached. All my staff knew who I was. And they were all kind of looking at me, just wondering what I was going to do to this guy. If I was going to call the police, if I was going to do something. So I said, all right, and I put on my coat. And I walked out, and to be honest with you, I had no idea what I was going to do when I got out there. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to think, I didn't know what to do for everybody that was watching. I just kind of wandered on out there and walked up to the guy, and he just put out his cup, and he said, hey, do you have any money? And then I said the first thing that came to mind. I said, have you eaten today? And this question threw him off guard. You know how oftentimes when you're just talking with people, we don't really engage with each other. You just, you know, it's that, that initial question, hey, how you doing? Nobody actually wants to know how you're doing. That's just, hello, that's what we're trying to say. But when you ask a question that kind of catches someone off guard, like next time you walk up to somebody, just walk right up to them and say, are you hungry? It'll change the whole conversation. I promise you, it'll be great. So I asked him if, if he'd eaten today, and he kind of shook his head and looked at me and looked around a little bit, and he was like, well, well no, no, I haven't. All right, we have something we can do then. So I asked him to come with me. We walked over to the, there was a little Caesars right beside my store. We went inside and I bought him one of those pizzas, you know, those super nutritious pizzas where the grease drips right off. You know, I bought him one of those. And I, in my head, I thought, oh, great, okay. I've done my duty. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Wonderful. And then as I was about to turn to leave and, and tell him, you know, you're welcome, that type of thing, there was a little voice inside that said, you're not done yet. And I didn't know what to do with that because my voice said, you're pretty much done. 
And so I looked at the guy, and I, I kind of looked at him for real this time, and, and I noticed that his gloves were, were kind of wrecked, you know, his fingers were all sticking out and, and from wear, and I noticed that his hat had a great big hole in it, and it was kind of getting cold outside. And so I said, well, tell you what, why don't you come with me? And we went across the street, there was a little Salvation Army that was across the street. When we went inside, we, we found some stuff for him, I bought it for him, and, and then I looked at him and I thought, you know what? he could really use some more. And so I got him a backpack and then we went across the street again to a convenience store and we bought him some, some other supplies. I got him some, some toothbrush and a toothpaste and I got him some nuts that he could carry and a couple bottles of water. And when all was said and done, I was like, there, I, I think you're set for the night. Um, and then I mentioned there was a, a shelter just up the road that I could walk him to if he was interested. And he was like, no, no, I think I'm good. And he said, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. And that was the end of it. If you're expecting some sort of super spiritual moment where, you know, I, I bless the man and beams from heaven come down and he was baptized and is now our associate pastor, that is not... <laughs> that's not what happened. Uh, that was it. He left. And I said, okay. And I went back to work. And when I got inside, the couple was still there. I mean, it would be like 40 minutes later. It was a long time afterwards. And they were still there, and they were still mad. So I took them aside, and I said, the man's not there anymore. It's safe to go out. And I never saw them again after that, but I wasn't terribly upset by that. Um, but what, what really was amazing to me is afterwards, afterwards, the staff members who knew I was a Christian, they actually started asking questions of me once again, and more specifically, asking questions about faith. Because you see, they saw that I was willing to actually do something with what I believed. I didn't just tell them that I, that I loved Jesus and somehow that made me a good person. I showed them that there was actually action that needed to be taken because none of them were willing to do that type of thing either. And one day, there was this girl, she was, she was talking to me about it, and, and she said to me, she said, man, that was super generous of you. I thought about that for a moment. What is being generous? What is that? Because honestly, it didn't feel like I was being generous. It was feeling like it was what I was supposed to do. I didn't realize that, that it would be interpreted in a different way. And I didn't even think of it as being generous because it was something that I felt I had to do because Christ told me to do it. That word generous, that pops up a lot in Scripture. And it reminds me of a guy, you might have known him, his name was Solomon. You recognize that name? He was a king in the Old Testament, way, way back in 1 Kings, in fact. And Solomon, when he came to power, it was not an easy transition. You see, the kingdom had already gone through a few years of civil war. There was all these problems as David came to the end of his life because, you see, David, while he was an excellent man of faith, that he was a man after God's own heart, he wasn't a very good ruler. He made some terrible decisions. He made some sinful decisions. And at the end of his life, the consequences of his sinful decisions came back to haunt him in a huge way. His family was in open revolt against him, and they were at each other's throats. And he had lost several sons by this point to civil war. And so the day came when it was time for him to announce a new king, because you see, David was about to die. And so he was going to pass on the throne to someone. And if you remember, kings, kings are not elected. And so there's not this, this kind of this kind of election time where you can go out and campaign for yourself and gain the kingship, it's up to the king, whoever gets to be it. Right? If Queen Elizabeth dies right now, who gets to be king? Prince Charles? Poor guy, he has to wait out his mom. She is the most long-lived person. She is so hardy, his son is going to be king before he ever will be. But that's how it works. The eldest son is the one that gets to be the king. And so this honor fell to a man by the name of Adoniah. He was in waiting, ready and excited to be the king. Well, Adoniah, he threw a party for himself. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 42, we find him in this party. Adoniah and all his guests, his friends, his family, were all sitting around waiting for something exciting to happen, waiting for the news, because they heard that, that David was going to announce on that particular day. 
So they were finishing the feast, and they hear this commotion outside. On hearing the sound of the trumpet, Joab, one of his, his entourage, asked, what's the meaning of all this noise out in the city? You know, he's doing that, ah, ah, it's time. And even as they were speaking, a man by the name of Jonathan, son of Abathar, the priest, arrived, a very important person in Israel. Adonijah said, oh, look, here he is, come on in. You must be a man with great news, good news. Let's hear what you have to say. And Jonathan's face goes white and he drops and he's not sure what to say. Not at all. He kind of creaks out of his voice. Our, our Lord, our King David, he's made Solomon king. In fact, Solomon has already taken his seat on the throne. This is a done deal, Adoniah. Also, the royal officials have come to congratulate our Lord King. And they said, may your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed in worship at his bedside. And he said, praise be to the Lord God of Israel who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. And look at this curious verse. At this all of Adonai's guests rose in alarm and dispersed. See, we've seen enough TV shows that we can imagine the kind of political climate at the time. When a king came to power, he needed to consolidate his power, which meant that he went out and took out any threats to his throne that were out there. Adonai was a threat to the throne because, you see, Adonai was supposed to be the king. And so all of his guests stood up at once and went, the guys are coming, they're going to kill us, we got to get out of here. And they dispersed. And over the next chapter, you find Adonijah trying very, very hard to take back the throne for himself. He does it in a variety of ways, and ultimately, Solomon winds up killing him because he's done this terrible thing, trying to usurp the throne from Solomon. So when Solomon comes to power, he has this guy, Adoniah, one of his own brothers, at his throat, trying to gain power in, in backroom deals and all this stuff, trying to come after him. He has his own court, people that he should be able to trust, that were his father's advisors, that are going off and making side deals. And one of them even tries to usurp the throne for himself. Solomon has the first three years of his kingship just trying to stop people from killing him. Now imagine in your job if that's what you had to do for the next three years. But it gets worse for Solomon. You see, outside of his palace, outside of the kingdom of Israel, there were people pressing in, trying to take advantage of the, the change in power. Because you see, David, if he's on his deathbed, he's not going to be very quick to respond. And so you had these Philistines that were off to the southwest, they weren't done as an empire yet. They were less of a threat by the time Solomon came to power, but they were still there. They could still affect some sort of change. In the north and in the east, you had these Ammonites, these, this kind of raiders that would come in and they would swoop in and take all the horses and take iron and take the main economic trade of the time. They would steal it all. They would even capture people as slaves and bring them back into their territory. And so this was happening all around him, but the real problem was to the south, this old enemy of Israel, some people by the name of the Egyptians. You see, Egypt didn't disappear after Moses was done. In fact, they spent a few hundred years trying to rebuild, and at this point in history, they're trying to reestablish themselves as the dominant power in the Middle East. And so Solomon, while he's just trying to stay alive, just trying to navigate the tricky, complicated politics of his internal palace, he has these enemies on the outside that are ready to pounce, ready to push in. And here's a man that finds himself in need of help. And so we see the very first thing that he does. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. Solomon made an alliance with the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Now, could you imagine this for a moment? Let's just imagine in Canadian politics, just for a second, set aside any partisan th feelings and thoughts you might have towards our current government, and just think, 
if Justin Trudeau was single and he married an ISIS princess. Think about that. This is what Solomon does. This is his first move. Is he goes and he marries an Egyptian princess. He does this so that he can consolidate some power, so that he can ensure that Egypt's not going to attack them. Because you see, Solomon has a few other things that he needs to do. The temple of God has not been constructed yet. It was something that David desperately wanted to do, but it still has not been done. Which means that the religious power is just kind of out there in the wind. And these, these priests and all the, all the people of Israel had no central place to come and to worship the Lord. And it says in the very next verse that the people were still worshiping at the high places. Not that they were worshiping pagan gods. Not that they were following the wrong god. But they had nowhere else to go. So they just went up to these places that used to be centers of worship to pagan gods. And they said, this is where we're going to worship God now. And that was all out there. And so he needed to build this temple. And to do that, he needed to make sure that the Egyptians weren't going to attack. So he marries this princess. And you can bet that the people were not happy about it. You see, Egypt had always been their enemy. Egypt had been the one that had enslaved them. Egypt was the one that they used in all their literature to to vilify evil, to personify evil. And he marries this princess. And here's the kicker, he was already married to an Israelite woman. In fact, he had several other Israelite wives. And so the people take a look at this and say, whoa, what are you doing, Solomon? And Solomon does this because he thinks it's something that's going to help him. And he realizes he needs to do something else. Because everything is about to tear itself apart in his kingdom. And so in verse 3, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father David. Except, he didn't have a temple. So he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. So the king came up with a plan. He went to Gibeon. Now this name would mean nothing to you or I, but you see, Gibeon was the last place where they actually had the tabernacle. This was the place where God would enter into the tent of meeting and He would come and sit inside the Ark of the Covenant. It was the most important thing in the worship of ancient Israel. And this was the last place that this was. It still had some of the articles there. It still had some of the priests there. It was the most important worship place. It was kind of the substitute for the temple. And so he goes to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. That was for the most that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings at that altar. Now hold on there. Hold on. Go back, guys. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings at that altar. A burnt offering was always given because it was believed that when you burned it, it would go directly to God. This is why they talk about burnt offerings. And in the Old Testament, God says, I I adore the aroma of the burnt offering. It's not that God really likes barbecue. That's not what this is. It's that, just just think about it, if you put something on an altar and you light it on fire, where does it go? It just disappears up into the sky, right? As as it's consumed by the fire, the flames lift it up and the smoke takes it up. They, They knew that it was being burned up in front of them, but they said, look, it's going up and it's being a part of God. So a burnt offering was something that was given directly to God to influence your relationship, to say, I admire, I love, I desire you. And this whole thing is solely, completely, and utterly for you. That's what a burnt offering was. And Solomon, he says, you know what? One burnt offering's not enough. I need some help, he says. I need to be right before God. I need to do this right because everything in my life is ready to tear itself apart. The kingdom itself is ready to tear itself apart. And David told me that the only way I could ever succeed is if I devote myself wholly and completely 
to God. That is the only path. Why would David know that? Because whenever he strayed from that path, everything went wrong. So Solomon knew, I need to devote myself 100% towards God. And so he gathered together enough animals to offer a thousand burnt offerings. Ladies and gentlemen, this didn't happen all at once. He didn't show up and in an afternoon say, there you go, there's a thousand, and they just did this whole thing. They did those animals one at a time on that altar. This would have taken weeks to accomplish. Because he was saying not only to God, God, I adore you, God, I love you, God, I give this whole gift to you. He was saying to all the leadership of his government. He was saying to the priests of Israel. He was saying to the people of Israel, we are going to be for God. This kingdom is going to be for God. And you want me to prove it? I'm going to give. And I'm going to give until it hurts. In an old society where most of your business is done by agriculture, grains, animals, that type of thing, could you imagine how expensive a thousand animals would be? This was an unbelievable gift. Dare I say that this gift was generous, extremely generous. But to Solomon, it was what he was supposed to do. God loves this kind of generosity. Over and over again in Scripture, God is impressed by generosity. Now don't get me wrong, He's not impressed by the dollar value. Because remember in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking about these these Pharisees who get their reward for being up in front of people and, and acting the act, He says, look at that woman over there, this poor widow. She just put in two pennies. It's worth nothing to the rest of us. But to her, that's everything she owns. Look at the generosity. I have never seen such faith as this. Jesus was impressed. Later on in Jesus' life, when he's about to go to the cross, he's he's in a room with these people and this woman comes and she takes this really expensive family heirloom. It's full of perfume that you use to prepare people for their death. And she pours out the whole thing on his feet. And this heirloom was worth thousands. And the people were shocked. Why did she waste all that money? That is terrible. And Jesus says, no, don't take away from her what she just did. I am impressed by her faith by her desire for me, for the ministry, for what God wants to do on this world. He is impressed. Look at this. Verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon that night in a dream. And He said, ask for whatever you want of me. Ask for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Why would God say to a man, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you? What would you say? Just think about it right now, just for a moment. God comes to you this evening and says, you know what? I've been watching. I'm really impressed with what you just did. I will give you anything you ask for. What would you say? I was standing in a McDonald's and the lady behind the counter said, what would you like? And at that point in time, I didn't know what I wanted. And so I looked up at the screen. And I don't know if you've been to a McDonald's recently, but if you don't know what you want before you get there, there's no way to make a choice. Can you show the screen, the McDonald's screen? This is in 2018, right? This is, look at the length of that menu board. And then not only do they put up this menu board that is that long, they have animations on it. So the thing that you want, you're just trying to read, you know, how much a cheeseburger is. And then it flashes away and they're trying to sell you a muffin. Or it, you know, like McDonald's uh, uh, Monopoly thing comes crashing in. And you have to wait five minutes before it cycles back to the thing that you actually want, right? And the poor lady, she's standing there, she's saying, what, what would you like? And I, I just don't know. Because you see, on the McDonald's menu right now, and this is a real number, I'm not making this up. McDonald's has 145 items on their menu. 145! Kids, did you know in 2007 when some of you were born, 
In 2007, there was only 87 items on the menu. Do you know how many things were on the menu in 1985 or 1982? There's only 41. And go back to this 1948. Here's a menu from 1948. There were nine items on the menu. <laughs> Made it a little bit easier to make a decision, didn't it, at that point? What do I want, a cheeseburger or um, a cheeseburger? I'll take a cheeseburger, please. And that's it. You could have it with or without cheese, and that's what you could have. Maybe a milkshake. And there you go. There's something to be said for simplicity. When you only have one choice to make, or you can only choose between two or three things, it's easy. Same thing happens to me when I go into Baskin and Robbins, <laughs> and they have the 31 flavors all laid out there. I don't know. Or Hewitt's. Hewitt's is the worst. You get 108 things that you can choose from, all of it sweet and delicious. I don't know what I want, right? God comes to you in a dream and says, ask me for anything, anything under the sun, and I will give it to you. Now here's a question. Has anyone here ever had God ask them that? I've never been asked that by God. In fact, I suspect that there are very few people on earth who have ever been asked that question by God. Because you see, God knows the intention of our hearts, doesn't He? God knows what we need. God knows what the response is going to be. God knows already. God was very impressed with Solomon's act of generosity. His act of faith. God was impressed by that. God knew from where he was coming, he knew the heart from where that question was asked. You see, God would never ask that to a person who was selfish. Never. In fact, in James, if you go back to the James verse, James chapter 4, verse 3, sometimes when we pray, we don't receive what we want because, look at this, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. God knows. He knows the intentions of our heart. He knows if we're truly desiring to get closer to Him, to see the expansion of His kingdom, to see, to see our faith grow within ourselves. He knows. And so when he looks at Solomon, he sees this act of generosity, this true desire of getting to know Him for real. And so he says in verse 7, Now Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. This in itself is a miracle. But I am only a child. The king of Israel is saying, I'm only a child. He's not a child. He's a grown man. But he says, in here, out here, all the stuff that is piling up against me, that my world is breaking in front of me, my relationships are failing, there is there's enemies at the gates. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm a child. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you, and those who are younger than me, I can tell you this. I'm 36 years old. I feel like a child every single day. When I'm around those of you who are a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more experienced, I am in awe of adulthood. And how you have come through some of the issues you've come through, how you've run businesses, how you've shared your faith with other people, I am constantly in awe of that. And I suspect, I may be off on this, but I suspect inside everybody still feels like that child. And you look at other people who are more seasoned than you and you say, oh, how did they get to be like that? Perhaps one of the things that we need to do and acknowledge before our Lord is, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I need your help. I'm a child. I do not know. I do not know how to carry out my duties. I was made king. I don't know what I'm doing. I just married this crazy woman from Egypt. She's terrible. She's scary. I can't even go near her. God, I don't know what I'm doing. Verse 8. Your servant is among the people you have chosen. A great people. Too numerous to count or to number. Do you see what he's saying here? Why me? All these people and you picked me. So, verse 9. Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people 
and to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. For who's able to govern this great people of yours? Look at that question. He said, look, I I don't know what to do. Help me know what is right and what is wrong. Help me just to choose. Help me to decide. Help me to understand the problem. Because all these situations are so complex. All the relationships around me are so messed up. All of this stuff is just too much. Help me to figure this out, God. What do you think God says to that? Nah, good luck. That's not the God we know. That's not what Christ promises us. That's not what He does. Look at this, verse 10. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this, and not for wealth for yourself, or have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk, now here's the key to the whole thing, if you walk in obedience to me, and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. He says, if you stick with the program, if you stay with me, all of this is going to work out. He says, I will give you what you've asked for. I will say yes. You truly can have a discerning heart. You really can know right from wrong. And you can stand on that. And you can know for certain that you are right. And you can know for certain that I am behind you. He says, not only that, all the other things will fall into place. You won't have a worry in the world. Not that things aren't going to happen out there. Not that the enemies are going to suddenly disappear. Not that your crazy wife is suddenly going to go away. None of that is going to happen. Instead, you will know what is right from what is wrong. And you will be able to stand firm in that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not promised wealth. We're not promised fame. And Christ doesn't go around and say, and all that will come to you as well. But Christ does say, knock, and the door will be open to you. Seek, and you will find. Ask, and it will be answered. He tells you that you too can have the discerning heart to know what is right and what is wrong. That you can stand squarely in the will of God and know that you are on solid ground. He says all of this can happen to you as well. And one of the keys to getting there is generosity. You see, the selfish heart tells us that there's not enough out there that we need to keep whatever it is, whether it's your time, whether it's your money, whether it's your relationship, whatever it is. It says you need to hold on to that. You need to, to grab onto it and don't let even an inch of it out there for someone else to have because if you do, it's going to go away. That's what the selfish heart says. And when God looks at us, He says, no, 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 if you want to know right and wrong, be generous. Just just give right now. Give. What will it cost you? And then God says something else. Everything's mine anyway. Just try it. I believe that generosity is a key to spiritual growth. I believe that it is a key to, to actually opening yourself up in prayer to the Lord. Actually opening yourself to what God has intended for your life. I truly believe this. And every time that I have ever been generous in my life, it comes with it a sense of joy, a sense of peace, a sense of hope, a sense of knowing that I have done the right thing. And that is worth its weight in gold by itself. So I have a few questions for you to end with today. And these you just need to ask yourself. Are you growing? Are you growing spiritually? If the answer is no, ask yourself this, and this is a tough one. Is it because I'm selfish? It's a hard question to ask yourself. Are there things in your life that you would rather protect than share with other people? Are there things in your life that you would rather have for yourself than give to, say, the church? 
Here's another question for you. When was the last time that you gave extravagantly to God? I'm not talking necessarily about money. When was the last time that you gave yourself to the Lord's to the Lord's leading when he says, hey, I really need you to do this right now, and it's this big thing. When was the last time that you've done that? What would happen if God asked you to do it tomorrow? I'm going to leave you with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Solomon. We thank you for his example of being open, being generous to you. Lord, we just ask that you can make us generous as well. That you can ask us, give us opportunities to demonstrate our generosity. In it, Lord, we know we will be doing what you have asked us to do. We know we will be doing right. So God, help us to have courage. Help us to leave behind all the things that hold us back. Help us to leave behind those things that we think we need to just stranglehold onto. Because, Lord, when we give them over to you, when we give them up to your kingdom and your purposes, wonderful, amazing things happen. So, Father, help us to trust. Help us to have courage. Help us to be your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.